our first candidate for the office of governor. We're home and let you have some idea about the issues and the answers that confront Kentuckians today. The other day I was on a TV program and the moderator started out and he says, uh, while other candidates for governor are running on better schools and more roads, Gatewood Galbraith is running on legalizing marijuana. And I said, hold it right there, Bob. Let's stop. Let's get one thing straight. Just like these other candidates, I envision better schools and more roads and delivery of health care to the rural areas and access to medical care. But what distinguishes me from these other candidates is that I figured out a way to pay for it without taking it out of the paychecks of the working men and women of the state of Kentucky. You know, Kentucky is first in illiteracy. We're among the very last in teenage pregnancy, and we have one of the lowest life expectancies of any state in the Union. No one is doing us any favors. We have to reach back into our own history and our own heritage and make our own favors to do this. As long as our vision is limited and constrained to trying to buy our way out of this situation by adding an increased burden upon the wages of the men and women of the state of Kentucky, we're going to stay last in all these standard living indexes. What I have attempted to do is to locate already existent streams of commerce, the fruits of which are ending up in hands of people far less deserving than the working men and women and the children of the state of Kentucky. But one of the things I want to do is license and tax marijuana as a cash crop and let our, our farmers make that money instead of these international criminal syndicates in South America and Mexico. You know, our granddaddies and grandmamas never did raise crack or cocaine or heroin, and I'm going to use this freed up law enforcement dollar and medical treatment personnel, and we're going to kick those hard drugs right square in the teeth. But I want to take the marijuana smoker and place them over into a licensed tax category so that not only our farmers can earn a living from the land, but that the marijuana smoker in Kentucky and America will start paying their fair share of the tax burdens of this state. The DEA says the American public smoked 35.7 million pounds of marijuana in 1988. I've written a, pa a plan that puts $1,000 a pound tax on each and every one of those pounds. That would generate, in the first year, $35.7 billion in new taxes with which our share, and if we're first in uh, that line and first to hit that market, our share will be immense. But just our pro rata share, we can solve many of the programs and, and plans to upgrade life in Kentucky by funding them, something that we're currently unable to do. You know, people say that I'm a one-issue candidate, but that's not true. And if I could, that label could be hanged on me. That issue would have to be poverty. Because selling marijuana as a recreational crop is only one part of what I seek to do. But let's get that out of the way first. I don't want public use of it. I don't want Friday night sales. I don't want golden arches. I don't want billboards. I don't want people driving and smoking it in the privacy of their own home or on other personal property with the, uh, with the agreement of the people who have that property. A person ought to be allowed to smoke marijuana. It's that simple. Marijuana is the number one medicine for the number one killer on this planet, which is stress. People who smoke marijuana live a year to a year and a half longer than people who do not. Marijuana is among the very best of medicines for, uh, not for uh, uh, headaches, migraines, epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, and it is the number one medicine for nausea associated with chemo and radiation therapy and for anore anorexia associated with nutrition blocking diseases like tuberculosis. It is inhumane to continue to deny this very best of medicines to the hundreds of thousands of Kentuckians who could benefit from it within the next five minutes. We're not talking about a 30-day program. We're not talking about uh, six months to satisfy a dosage requirement. We are talking about in the next five minutes, hundreds of thousands of Kentuckians could immediately medically benefit off marijuana hemp in their hands if they had access to it. And Governor of Kentucky, when I take that office, I am going to make this available not only to the people in Kentucky, but to the millions of Americans around the country who are currently spending billions and billions and billions of dollars on less effective synthetic pharmaceutical uh, drugs. <clears throat> Hemp as a cash crop in relationship to agricultural fuel is the message that I want to get across to you most. Ladies and gentlemen, whether you agree with me on any other point, what I'm about to tell you represents Kentucky's most spectacular opportunity to lift themselves out of the cycle of poverty in which we find ourselves. <clears throat> Congress, which is bought and paid for by the petrochemical pharmaceutical industries, last year passed the Clean Air Act. They did that because of the tremendous environmental costs associated with continuing along the lines of a fossil fuel petroleum energy base. 
You see, when you burn fossil fuel petroleum, you release carbons, fossil carbons, out into the air where they overbalance the ecosystem, and you release sulfur into the air, which causes acid rain, global warming. And so Congress last year passed the Clean Air Act, which mandates that in 1992, the American car manufacturers must begin constructing increasing percentages of cars that run off agricultural fuel. <clears throat> Pardon me. By the year 2010, every car built in America must run off of agricultural fuel. It's the federal law. Illinois has already passed special state legislation trying to put corn oil ethanol into a leadership position in that market. But ladies and gentlemen, wonder of wonders, you get four to ten times the amount of energy off an acre of hemp as you do corn. Hemp is petroleum. That is the reason the petrochemical companies engineered its illegality 60 years ago. They did not want our farmers or the farmers of America producing agricultural energy in competition with the monopolies that they have on petrochemical pipelines right now. What has this dependence upon these pipelines done to us as a nation? It has drawn the Kentucky farmer and all other farmers out of competition with producing the uh, uh, fuel for the largest market and the largest economic market uh, in the world. Uh, our farmers can no, make, no longer make a living off the land because they've been replaced by the synthetic fuel manufacturers and the synthetic medicine manufacturers. As a matter of fact, a farmer who insists on growing medicine or fuel from the earth or a citizen who insists on taking their medicine and fuel from the natural cycle of things is now considered to be a second-class citizen or a criminal. How large and powerful has this government gotten to the point to where they can relegate to a second-class status or imprison a large segment of a generation which insists that they do not want to have to deal with the monopolies in these synthetic products, that they would be rather buying it from the, from the natural cycle where the income goes to our farmers. That's what we're doing, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to put Kentucky Farmer back into competition with the synthetic pipelines for fuel and the synthetic laboratories for medicine. Hemp was the largest cash crop in the state for over 100 years. We're not known as the potato state. We're not known as the green pepper state. We're known as the hemp state. And it was our largest cash crop, and we cannot afford to disregard that history and heritage. I'm not talking about building a Disneyland that has never existed before. I'm not talking about planting us in potatoes. I'm talking about going back to a crop that your granddaddies grew and the tax proceeds from which built many of the courthouses and schools in this state. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a police state. Uh, there's no doubt about it. You can go out and get in your car right now. Uh, you can go out on the street. The police can set up a random roadblock in front of you. They can make you get out of the car and bring up a dog to sniff you, your car, and all its belongings. They can take blood out of your arm. They can make you pee in a bottle, and they can stick their hands where the sun don't shine if they think you're hiding something. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a police state. You think John Lane would put up with that? John's riding his horse down the trail. They drop a log in front of him and say, John, get off that horse. We're going to take blood out of your arm. You've got to pee in this bucket. We're going to stick our hands down your pants. I don't think John Wayne would put up with that. I think John would say something like, uh, I'm afraid not, Pilgrim. This is where I draw my line in the sand. Well, I'm drawing my line in the sand here, ladies and gentlemen. I wouldn't have a policeman's job. It's one of the hardest jobs in this whole society, and they don't get paid enough, and I would like to see their pay increase. But at the same time, I want to remove from their hands legislatively large areas of regulations and laws which they are forced to enforce right now because, in my view, it is the role of government to police law and order and not morality. That is one of the reasons why, as a pro-choice candidate, <clears throat> my acceptance of Roe versus Wade has nothing to do with my own personal views which differ from that. Uh, I happen to believe life begins at conception, but that is my own personal view. <clears throat> and as the decision of the Supreme Court in Roe versus Wade uh, satisfies a lot of needs and satisfies a lot of uh, competing interests. So I don't think, as governor, I should place my own morality on the system of law. So consequently, I would leave those kinds of decisions to the individual. You see, I trust you. I trust every one of you who are watching this program right now. I trust you to make the decisions about your bodies and your minds and your behavior uh, instead of a centralized government thousands of miles or hundreds of miles away making those decisions for you. That's the kind of system of government that was just thrown off in Eastern Europe. Uh, a drive for autonomy, a drive for individualism, and uh, uh, states having the power instead of a centralized federal government uh, that intrudes on us. I'm the most conservative candidate in this race. When I was growing up, conservative meant you kept the government in a little box. You didn't let it out. 
When you take that lid off the box, government gets out, it becomes self-serving, it grows too fast, it becomes self-aggrandizing, and no doubt about it, too expensive, which is what's happened now, and it ends up on the shoulders of the taxpayer. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm the most conservative candidate in this race. I'm going to take government off the backs of business and people and put it right back in that box where it belongs. I'm going to take government out of your bedrooms, your bloodstreams, your bladders, and your back pocket, and I'm going to put it back in that box where it belongs. I'm going to cut the cost of government. If I had had my way, uh, by now, we would already have taken money out of corrections and putting it into public health and mental health. I want to get nutrition and education and medical attention to the young folks in this state before they grow up as maladjusted adults and we have to end up thinking we've got to put them in prison in order to, in order to satisfy uh, the problems of this society. Uh, my view is that, that any government that tells you that doubling the prison population over the next 20 years is a solution to the present day problem has its head stuck where it's never going to discover the thousand points of light of George Bush. We have to take government and we've got to convert its whole attitude. I believe in government uplifting and promoting and encouraging. I don't believe government in punishing and penalizing and building more prisons. One of the reasons that, uh, that I believe that is because they want to take license away from 16-year-old drivers who drop out of school. Maybe some of them have to. Why should government and the school system put a burden on them? Let's have those people come into the class once a week and tell their classmates what an educational experience it is to, to have to work for a living and let them submit a term paper at the end of the year and give them credit for it. Let's uplift people. Let's change the attitude in the state. Ladies and gentlemen, Kentucky can change it. Uh, four years ago, we had the Berlin Wall, but it's gone now. Uh, four years ago, we had a constitutional prohibition against the lottery, and it's gone. It's because people wanted it gone, because people banded together to do something different and got it changed. I want your vote, ladies and gentlemen. I would appreciate your vote. There'll be a whole new ballgame in the state of Kentucky today. I take office as governor. Thank you so very much.